Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Tiffany Tay, and I am the Executive Director of Annual Giving and Alumni Relations here at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Welcome to our Viterbi Live webinar featuring Dr. Eva Dealman. We started this Viterbi Live series almost three months ago to bring you timely, relevant content and research to our engineering community. And I hope you're all able to join us for a few. If not, um, all webinars have been recorded and can be accessible on our online events page, which will be pasted in your chat box. While most of that content has revolved around COVID-19 research, we wanted to also highlight some of the extraordinary developments that have come out of other areas on our campus, um, especially the USC Information Sciences Institute. So Dr. Eva Dealman joined ISI in 2000, where she is serving as a research director and is leading the Science Automation Technologies Group. This group explores the interplay between automation and the management of scientific workflows that include resource provisioning and data management. Her group has led the design and development of the Pegasus workflow management software and conducts research in job scheduling and resource provisioning in distributed systems, workflow performance modeling, provenance capture, and the use of cloud platforms for science. Really, really amazing stuff. So please join me in welcoming today, Dr. Eva Dealman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiffany, for that uh, introduction. Let me try to pull up my slides. All right. Okay. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes, looks great. Great. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, I joined uh, USC in 2000. And uh, since the very beginning, I was always interested in developing algorithms and software that can enable scientists to do better science. And in 2001, I created uh, with my group the first version of a Pegasus workflow management system, uh, which is used today by a number of scientific uh, domains. Uh, scientists use it mostly to orchestrate the complex scientific workflows that are executed on a variety of different uh, cyber infrastructure. So today, I would like to talk to you about uh, developing such uh, cyber infrastructure over time, how to sustain it, and how the Pegasus workflow management system has evolved and um, uh, over the years. So if we look at, um, in general, if you're posing a scientific question, and in this particular context, we're looking at um, a question in, in of science, astronomy, and neuroinformatics, or, or other fields, you pose it, you, yourself a question, you develop a hypothesis of what the answer could be, you uh, sometimes you need to be able to, uh, this analytical formulation is not possible, or the solution is so complex that you need to run simulations to, to get the answers. So oftentimes you're developing uh, various computational scripts, uh, various codes to, to answer these questions, and oftentimes also these uh, codes, uh, it's not a single monolithic uh, computational program, but really you're developing with your collaborators most often a series of these codes that are tied together into a bigger whole to answer these questions. And in the case of um, uh, many cases, these uh, workflows are created basically using the, a number of different computational codes created by various scientists and they executed on a variety of computational resources. So it could be a campus cluster at USC. It could be a national high performance computing system. Uh, today, also a number of applications are running in the cloud. When you're running these workflows, you need to worry about monitoring. So seeing how the computations progress, you need to worry about debugging if faults occur. You need to also record how the particular answers are, are achieved. In the end, you get a, a scientific result where you can publish uh, in a particular uh, journal or present at a conference. Obviously, uh, most of the time, this process is not so linear. You go back and forth and so forth. But in our work, we, we focus primarily on, oops, on this part of the process. So looking at um, developing scientific workflows, automating the execution on distributed resources, providing tools for the scientists to monitor and debug the workflows and recording the provenance information. Since the very beginning, uh, we grounded our work uh, working with a number of scientific uh, applications. In particular, since 2001, we've been working with LIGO, 
the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which uh, had uh, the big discovery of a century uh, in 2016, the first ever detection of a gravitation, direct detection of a gravitational wave. Back in 2001, they're still developing uh, and building the instruments, developing their uh, software analysis. And uh, this was also the time that uh, we developed our first uh, Pegasus prototype to support uh, the, the research. Uh, really, it took 10 years for us to, to uh, jointly obtain an important scientific result uh, that was important to them and to us, and that was the blind uh, injection detection. So at the time, the, the LIGO uh, instruments were not sensitive enough to detect a gravitational wave, but scientists wanted to be sure that if such a wave passed through the instruments, the software would be able to detect and analyze the signal uh, efficiently and accurately. In uh, 2011, uh, a small group of scientists uh, from LIGO have injected into the data stream a fake gravitational wave signal the software uh, had picked that up as a gravitational wave and then during a big meeting of, of uh, scientific LIGO scientific collaboration it was uh, the envelope was open and, and it turned out it was not a real signal by the blind, blind injection um, obviously uh, this was not as big of a, a splash as later on in 2016 however this proved that the infrastructure the cyber infrastructure of the software um, that LIGO has been developing and the scientific methods that go along with that were uh, good enough, accurate enough to detect a wave should one uh, pass the detector. Since uh, 2011, the LIGO detectors have been upgraded significantly and uh, reopened uh, for business in 2015 when they detected the signal um, in the data, uh, 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 in the data coming off the detectors. And uh, after six months of analysis, they uh, declared uh, and announced the first ever direct detection of a gravitational wave that was a result of the collision of two black holes. Uh, in 2017, there was another uh, really significant detection that LIGO has, um, has made, and that was a detection of a merger of uh, neutron stars and that was significant because that detection was also captured by other uh, telescopes that looked at that particular area of the sky. And also in 2017, the LIGO scientists have received the Nobel Prize for their work. If we look at the computational side of things and see what it took to, um, to do this computations for the first uh, gravitational wave detection in 2015, it uh, took about 21,000 workflows, computational workflows that needed to be executed. And it's, cumulatively, these workflows had about 107 million of computational tasks in them that needed to be managed. So the ingredients for this detection, obviously on the computational side was the scientific workflow and the, science, the computational scientific codes that LIGO has developed. Uh, this code measured the statistical significance um, of the data uh, that was needed for discovery. So looking at um, different signal to, to noise ratios and other aspects of the signal um, to make sure that it was really a gravitational wave. Uh, then uh, it took the automation that we provided with Pegasus to execute these uh, complex scientific workflows on the cyber infrastructure that was available uh, to LIGO and these included their own resources, but also um, other clusters and high performance computing resources that were uh, made available by the National Science Foundation. If we look a little bit deeper about uh, into what it takes to, to build software such as Pegasus, and, and maybe first I'd like to introduce uh, the concept altogether of cyber infrastructure, the definition that we use. And we define that as being composed of computing systems, um, data storage systems, advanced instruments, data repositories, and visualization environments, and obviously uh, people as well. And that's a particularly nicely, uh, nice aspect of this definition um, that was developed by Craig Stewart and his collaborators. That's all connected by software and high performance network that enable research and, and breakthroughs not otherwise possible. However, if you look at the trajectory of Pegasus over these uh, 19 years, it really um, 
takes a lot of time to, to build and sustain such software. So in particular, from my point of view, what, what worked really for us uh, in this um, aspect is that we did have a multi-domain engagement with a number of different sciences, and I'll mention some in my talk. We also have conducted uh, computer science research over the years. So the research was geared towards improving the software that we're developing, looking at whatever uh, challenges that we need to address in this evolving uh, technology landscape. And we also combined it with a development uh, of a software, obviously, but we, we were very careful to reuse existing cyber infrastructure solution over time so that we did not reinvent everything from scratch. First and foremost, I think it, it takes uh, people to build uh, sustainable software and it takes time to build a team and the expertise. So in, uh, in, in our team, uh, we have a number of graduate students um, and both master and PhD students that have contributed uh, to the ideas and to the research uh, over the years, uh, postdocs as well. But we also have a very strong core team of uh, developers, computer scientists, and um, research professors that uh, contribute to the software development and to the research um, in Pegasus. And in particular, uh, Karen Vahi, who you see here in the back, has been uh, a part of the project since um, 2001, so for over 19 years. So uh, how did uh, Pegasus start? Uh, so uh, Pegasus came out of a project that was funded by the National uh, Science Foundation and was uh, called the Griffin. And the idea of uh, behind this project was to um, develop the concept of a virtual data grid. And in a virtual data grid, the idea was that the data, uh, the data suppliers would publish the data to the grid and then the users, so the scientists could request other raw or derived data from the grid without actually needing to know whether this data was already um, stored somewhere or needed to be computed or where it was located. So then the system based on, on a user request would go out and find out whether the data was already available. If not, it would compute it. So in the LIGO, for example, if we apply this uh, scenario, uh, to the LIGO concept, LIGO, a LIGO scientist could come in and say to, uh, to the system that they wanted to conduct a POSA search on the data collected uh, for a particular time period. And then for each of, of these data, the system would uh, try to understand the request. It will try to determine if it already is instantiated. So maybe somebody else already uh, asked for it or it was computed somehow. And then um, if it was not, then plan the data movements, access to the data, the computations that were required to um, obtain the results and finally execute this plan. So uh, in our uh, approach in, in 2001, we developed this interface for LIGO that you see uh, on the left, where the user would put in the start time um, of, uh, of a time period they were interested in, uh, the detector that they're looking at and um, uh, decide where they wanted the output data to go. Um, then we used uh, various AI planning techniques. That was a work with Yolanda Gill and Jim Blythe uh, at the time to develop what you see on the right. So this workflow where uh, the data was taken from the archive, where the uh, raw channels of the data were cleaned, were transposed, um, a time frequency image was constructed. And then finally there's uh, the potential candidate wave was stored in the event database. So this was all automated coming from, from the left hand side where um, the user made the request to, to the final data product uh, that ended up in a database. What it turned out when we presented this uh, prototype to the LIGO scientist, they um, thought that the level of abstraction was too high. So they rather, they didn't want to deal with this interface on the left, rather they wanted to think about uh, the computations in this type of workflow fashion. So whatever steps that are needed from the, uh, taking the data to, um, to actually uh, getting the result. So our new research direction became the uh, re-management of these workflows that you see on, on the right in the types of environments that the users uh, were operating in. And in particular, LIGO and others were operating in distributed computing uh, environments. At that time, we also were working with other scientists uh, in, um, 
in astronomy and also earthquake science, particularly at the Southern California Earthquake Center at USC. And we, we found that we had, um, although the domains were very different, we found that they had some common challenges in the area of workflow management. So they all needed to describe the complex workflows uh, in a simple way. Um, they needed to access uh, distributed uh, heterogeneous data um, and resources. So the data was naturally distributed in the environment. And they needed to, to deal with resources and software that changed over time. So if you imagine the lifespan of our collaboration with LIGO over uh, almost 20 years, um, the systems used in 2001 are very different from the ones that we look at, uh, that we're using today, and the software on the system has changed as well. So our Pegasus software needed to, to evolve with that. Um, so our focus really became to, to separate the workflow description from the workflow execution, so that the workflow description developed by the scientists could stand the test of time, while the, the workflow execution developed by Pegasus would adapt to these particular different particular environments. And so we focus really on the workflow planning, so planning this execution and the scheduling, looking at issues of scalability and performance, which are so important for these large scale uh, applications. And then when you're executing the task on a distributed environment, then you need to deal with issues of monitoring uh, the execution, fault tolerance, well, number of failures that occur during execution for a variety of reasons, and then uh, debugging as well. If we look at the typical uh, environment in which uh, the scientists live, they have uh, their work definition. Um, oftentimes we work with them uh, on a whiteboard describing um, how the uh, computations are, are organized. And this is an example of an RNA-seq um, workflow that was designed uh, with a CAC uh, scientist at, at USC. They often have some local resource. It could be a laptop or maybe a server um, in the lab. Um, they sometimes have a data source, so like uh, our CAC researchers um, had um, uh, sequencers that they used to collect the data and some local storage. At the same time, this local environment is often, often not enough for scientists to do the work, but we do have access to other resources, um, distributed resources over the network. So they have high performance computing clusters um, such as those at, at uh, USC. Uh, they have um, other high performance computing clusters that are funded by NSF. Um, DOE facilities also make the computational resources available. And there are also both academic and uh, commercial clouds that you can uh, run on. However, if you look at the, all these different resources, they have different interfaces to schedule jobs. They have different interfaces uh, to access the data. And so if we look at even if you do trying to do this by hand, let's take a, a simple, sim simple uh, hello world example. So it's a workflow that has basically two um, uh, two different steps. One is to run hello and one is to run world um, on file f.a, generate file f.b, and then world would generate file f.c. So what do you have to do to even run hello? So you need to log into to the system where you want to execute the computations. You need to write the script which would take this um, hello um, example, hello world, and um, submit it uh, to the system for execution. You need to bring in your input data, uh, so your experimental data that you want to, to run the computations on. You need to then submit the script that you wrote and transfer the files once the, the, the monitor of the execution, once the execution is complete, you would uh, bring back the data for further analysis. So what happens, uh, so this is just for one job. Now we talked about LIGO having to uh, run uh, millions of jobs uh, for the uh, confirmation of a detection of a gravitational wave. So what happens if a system goes down or gets decommissioned? What if uh, a number of these jobs crash? What if you need multiple resources to run on uh, to, um, to obtain the scientific results? So these are the questions uh, that the Pegasus workflow management system addresses. And we have an approach of uh, submitting locally and computing globally. So the work definition, uh, the user de defines the workflow and it stays within the local environment. They also place the workflow management system, Pegasus, uh, onto the local resource. And from there, Pegasus uses 
um, um, the HD Condor uh, software developed by our collaborators to submit um, jobs to the distributed resources and also to access data, um, local data and across uh, the network. So um, if we look a little bit deeper at Pegasus, uh, Pegasus operates at the level um, of files and individual applications. So individual tasks in the workflow are co individual codes uh, that uh, take in files and generate files. Uh, it allows scientists to describe the computational processes uh, at a, a logical level. So we, we don't tie the computations to particular resources. Rather, we talk about logical file names and logical computations. So that allows us for portability. So the same workflow can be executed uh, across a number of different uh, uh, cyber infrastructures. So it could be a high performance computing system. It could be um, a, a local uh, laptop uh, or anything in between or a cloud. Uh, the workflows that uh, our scientists design can have uh, millions of tasks and, as and access terabytes of data. As the workflow is executing, uh, Pegasus captures the provenance information, so it will tell the scientists exactly what computations have taken place, which resources they used, which data they accessed, and so forth, so that we can support reproducibility as well and inspection of what's going on uh, with the system and how the results were obtained. And it also includes a monitoring and debugging tools, some of which you see on the right, to enable the scientists to see the progress of the, of the workflows and also um, to debug the problems if they occur. Although Pegasus tries to recover from a number of system failures, some of the failures um, it, uh, require user attention. In terms of how users uh, develop workflows, they use various uh, composition tools. We can use Wings, which was developed uh, at ISI as well by Yolanda Gill. But they can also use um, the usual programming languages such as Python, R, Java, um, and, and others. And uh, it's also integrated with a Jupyter notebook. If we look at um, how the, the workflows look like and what Pegasus does, it takes what we call the abstract workflow. So this is a workflow that's devoid of resource descriptions and talks about logical files and, and logical transformations. And it maps it, it generates um, executable workflow, which now has particular ties to particular resources. So it, it will know that particular jobs in the workflow will execute on, on um, it selects resources where it's gonna execute. It adds nodes to the workflow uh, to stage the data into the, uh, to these resources. It also adds nodes to stage the data out to the, where the user wanted to go. It has data registration jobs, so you can register the data in a data catalog so you can find it again. And it also has data cleanup jobs that clean up the data as the workflow goes along. And that basically enables uh, the execution of workflows that have um, a large, amounts of data that flows through them, uh, sometimes more than its cap uh, particular systems are capable of holding. So this, um, after the mapping from this abstract to the executable workflow, the, uh, the executable workflow is given, this is now a plan of what, what needs to happen. This plan is given to, to a workflow engine for execution. So uh, we draw, drew on a number of computer science uh, principles when uh, we're developing Pegasus. Uh, first and foremost, we structured the workflows as directly cyclic graphs. And that gave us uh, the ability to reuse uh, a number of um, existing graph traversal algorithms, uh, node clustering algorithms, pruning, and other uh, complex graph transformations. And then uh, our focus became other parts uh, of, of a problem. We also, the DAG also, um, the director case of graph enabled us to achieve scalability. If we use higher cost structures, so putting a workflow within a workflow, uh, it enables recursion and also dynamic behavior. Based on, on these structures, we also developed new algorithms for task clustering for um, workflows where the jobs were short running. Uh, data placement algorithms to uh, place uh, the data where, where the computations uh, needed, um, resource estimation algorithms, resource provisioning, uh, and others, 
Uh, we're also collaborating on uh, looking at in-situ workflows that tightly couple the various workflow components. Um, as I mentioned before, we also leverage uh, proven solutions. So we have, uh, since the beginning, we have been relying on the HD Condor uh, software out of University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, to do job submission to heterogeneous and distributed resources, um, to manage the dependencies within uh, the executable workflow, and to support some of the fault uh, tolerance. Uh, as a result, we're able to focus uh, on other aspects of automation so the planning of the workflows, replanning in case of failures, um, automated data management, so the data, the user doesn't have to specify it, this happens automatically within the system. Um, APIs that we provide to the users, various uh, monitoring tools, and the specialized workflow execution engines that work on high performance computing systems, and also data integrity. So um, in our work, uh, we used a number of different uh, applications, not only to contribute to them, but we also use them for our testing. Uh, so the montage work for application has become very important for us. Um, we use it to, it, it's scalable, it uh, uses open data and it's open source. So we use it to um, test our algorithms uh, and our software, it's part of our nightly builds. So it, it really enabled us to, to make the software um, much more robust when we're using realistic uh, workloads. Uh, another application that really has been um, a great collaborator and uh, really tested the limits uh, of Pegasus is uh, the USC's uh, Southern California Earthquake Center application, uh, CyberShake. And the goal of CyberShake is to, uh, among others, to answer the question, what will be the peak uh, earthquake motion that one can experience in particular areas of uh, California over the next 50 years? So to answer these questions, the scientists at USC and, and their collaborators are building, uh, computation building these um, uh, probabilistic seismic hazard maps uh, of California. Sometimes uh, they first focused on Southern California, but recently expanded to, to Northern California as well. And this information can then be used by building engineers uh, to develop new building codes, disaster planners, to plan for better physical infrastructure and insurance agencies to, to um, forecast risks. If we look at how much it, uh, how computation intensive these maps are, if you look at the total map of uh, California, where you have the white dot shows you the various workflows that were run uh, to compute this map, it took uh, about 120 million core hours to do the computations, over 39,000 jobs. Uh, 1.2 petabytes of data was managed uh, by the uh, workflow system and uh, about 14 terabytes of that data was archived uh, for use in generation of these maps. So it, it, um, it took a, a significant amount of computation to generate uh, the, the maps of Northern and, and then Southern California and automation was key uh, to the success. Um, another thing that we saw from working with various scientific domains is that the cross-pollination between these uh, domains is very uh, beneficial uh, to the development of the software, but also uh, to, to the applications as well. So this uh, graph shows the various releases of the Pegasus software over time since um, its inception to, uh, to the last release, latest release in 2019. And uh, at the top, you see the various developments uh, and solutions that we put in place for LIGO. Uh, these were uh, primarily driven by the need for LIGO to manage large data sets uh, within uh, the computational workflows. And the infrastructure that we're operating on had limited amount of space. So this data cleanup algorithms were very important. Um, various data transfer tools uh, were important to them as well. And uh, they, um, working as a large collaboration, they also needed to have monitoring tools where a number of LIGO scientists could come in and look at the results of the workflows. Uh, why not, uh, even those scientists that were not directly involved in running uh, the software. Um, also, uh, I need to mention that the LIGO workflows are primarily uh, uh, high throughput uh, throughout uh, the computational time. 
Uh, on the bottom, you see the developments in Pegasus that were primarily driven by SCEC. And SCEC has a mixture of high performance MPI uh, power codes and also um, single core jobs. So for them, we looked at uh, issues of how do you manage um, the high uh, single core jobs on HPC cluster so that you can uh, execute the whole uh, workflow within uh, an HPC cluster like the one at USC, for example. So both the parallel side and also the single core execution. So there we looked at task clustering and at um, the partitioning techniques uh, for the graph. And what happened in 2015 when LIGO needed a, a, a number of uh, sides for grid, uh, NSF offered them uh, the ability to run on high performance computing clusters um, that, uh, that were part of the XSEED, the XSEED project. And as a result, like of uh, advances that we've done for SCEC of running the single core workloads on HPC resources, LIGO was able to take that, that capability that was already available in Pegasus and utilize it uh, for the uh, discovery. So uh, this really showed us that it's uh, even though the, the, um, the software may be driven by different domains, if you distill the information to a point which is generic enough that in general enough that can be applicable across the means of this, this that different definitely benefits um, to a number of applications. So I, I showed in a number of projects which are large scale collaborations. Uh, however, we also work with individual uh, researchers and uh, we arm them basically with these capabilities to execute large scale workflows on a variety of uh, uh, environments. And this is an example from Aria Gladstein from um, when she was a PhD student at the University of Arizona. And then in her PhD thesis, she was uh, asking uh, questions uh, like, uh, how did humans spread across the world? And what are the demographic events that led them to, to move in, in particular directions? And she used uh, genetic information collected uh, from different populations to um, be able to trace the heritage uh, of this population uh, throughout, um, throughout time. In order to, this, this was a very computationally uh, intensive project uh, and uh, she used the Open Science Grid, which is a, a combination of a, a collaboration of a number of different institutions that provide the high throughput computing clusters to a joint collaboration. And she was able to um, use 40 uh, execution sites, so 40 different clusters at different institutions. She ran, to do her work, she ran 12 million jobs uh, which were spread across 342 workflows and consumed um, uh, over 7 million of core hours uh, of computing. So significant work uh, done by, by a single scientist. So just a brief summary of the observations. So I talk at the beginning, you know, what, what made us successful and uh, still here. Um, Multi-domain engagement was key. Uh, we conducted computer science research to improve the software. We used other people's software uh, while we developed our uh, solutions on top of it. Uh, but also having a strong team and collaborators uh, has been very beneficial to us. And also we've been uh, able to sustain funding from NSF, uh, DOE and other sources for our work. So it, just a couple last slides of, if we look ahead, um, uh, I, I do see uh, in our work, we do see a, a growing demand for, for automation. And we also ha have resources that are becoming, the computational resources that we run on are becoming much more complex and more challenging and, and demand this uh, greater need, uh, greater automation. So for example, the high performance computing systems, which were very homogeneous up to, re up to recent years, now are becoming much more complex. They are becoming much more heterogeneous. They have GPUs, they have FPGAs. They have various uh, specialized uh, storage such as burst buffers and others. And they're also increasingly faulty. Um, so they're becoming actually more, look more like distributed systems. The distributed systems um, now are also becoming much more complex. So you have software defined capabilities. 
where you can um, have software defined networks, for example, that you can provision um, network bandwidth um, when you're executing workflows. They also have specialized data storage that is being uh, becoming more complex. And uh, obviously clouds have entered the scientific arena um, where scientists can rely on them to, to do their computations, but they can be very heterogeneous and there are also costs that are associated with uh, using them. So resource management is really uh, key moving forward, more so than um, up to now, I believe. And we need to worry about constraints of time and budget and the capability of these different resources. Uh, we need to worry about uh, the environment being faulty and detecting these errors, um, attributing them to particular issues and then recovering from them, and also dealing with these very heterogeneous environments. Um, at the same time, uh, there are also a significant um, amount, signif there's significant innovation that's happening in industry, especially in the area of big data and more recently in machine learning. And a number of these solutions that have been developed in industry, I think, are very applicable uh, in our scientific domain. And as we uh, adopt some of these technologies and we we use more AI um, to uh, to to give us automation that we seek and uh, from our systems and make them more um, robust and uh, more capable. I think there are also uh, challenges uh, that, uh, that are growing um, as a result of these decisions. Um, some of them have to deal with trust. So how do we know that what we observe is real? So if um, we automate too many things or we don't understand exactly uh, how the automation has happened, so we don't have transparency. It's very difficult to, to figure out um, if the results, scientific results, are, are really um, uh, true. Um, the, we, it also, uh, understanding what's happening with the systems is becoming much more complex as you have more moving parts and more automation. And the reproducibility of the results is also uh, becoming more difficult. So there are a number of challenges that, that we need to address. And in general, if we looked back in history, automation has always brought big changes uh, into the society and into the workforce in particular. But I think the automation that we provide in science now also will affect the, the science workforce. And so uh, the questions that uh, I'm wondering about is that how, how will the scientists of the future look like? So how will they interact with the machines? How will they pose their hypothesis? and how the um, machines will interpret and explore the solutions. So will we have an easy button, for example, to, to detect gravitational waves? And with that, um, I would like to, to thank you very much uh, for listening uh, to my talk. And I would like to thank uh, my team, my amazing collaborators, and um, also the, uh, the funders of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dielman. You talk about your team a lot, so you must miss being in the lab. Oh, yes, <laughs> uh, definitely. We, we, we're conducting our meetings with, with, uh, via Zoom, um, which you, know, it, you do see the faces and you get to interact, but it's not the same as uh, in-person interactions. And it's amazing how much uh, we miss that. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Do you, do you have an estimate as to when you can actually head back? Uh, so that, that's a question that we decided at the USC and ISI levels. So um, uh, I think we, we have developed plans of uh, how who needs to go back first and who has the biggest needs. Yes, um, yes. A lot of our work can be, um, technically it can be done online, mm -hmm. but it's really the, um, the technical discussions sometimes that are enabled by face-to-face -face, uh, interactions are very different from the ones that are on Zoom. And right, uh, right. a mix of collegial and uh, technical discussion is also very important. Absolutely, absolutely. So throughout your talk, we've had some online and offline questions come in. Uh, the first being, is there a use case for Pegasus at the enterprise level? If so, can you provide some examples? So we, um, most of our applications are in the science domain. Uh, however, if um, you work within the environment where you need to uh, orchestrate the execution of a number of uh, different processes, um, complex processes over time, um, that Pegasus would be applicable in that type of environment as well. 
So um, you can have, um, you know, the drug discovery type of computations that really touch upon the scientific area as well, uh, can be executed in internal uh, enterprise level systems, for example. Um, so I think that there are opportunities, that's not something that, that we have pursued, but uh, Pegasus is open source and it's available uh, for people to download and use. And um, I just highlighted some of the applications that we work with closely, but others have picked up the software and used it on their own. Fantastic, thank you. And you had mentioned that Pegasus had to evolve over 20 years, which is a tremendous amount of time. So what is the most difficult part of sustaining a software for over two decades? Um, so uh, people, I think, are, are number one, because if you don't have expertise, then part enables you to have people um, is funding. So uh, ISI is a soft money institution. So we, we bring in uh, our funding uh, mostly from uh, federal agencies. Uh, Pegasus has been strongly supported by NSF. But over the course, uh, and DOE and NIH and also DARPA, but over the course of the years, you have to kind of stitch the funding together. So it's not one giant uh, grant that worked from 2000 to 2020. It's really the different types of grants, uh, some of them directed towards research that uh, fund um, uh, GRAs, uh, some of them uh, toward, geared towards sustain, specifically sustaining the software and providing support for the users and that has been uh, primarily supported by the NSF Office of Cyber Infrastructure. Uh, so they've been uh, big funders uh, of this effort. Thank you. Another question just came in. What types of algorithms does Pegasus mainly use and how often will it crash? Ah, oh, so a good question. So um, we use a, a, it, a number of different uh, algorithms that are mostly used based on, on graph traversal. Um, some algorithms are used, uh, uh, some decisions are made based on uh, different policies. For example, when we select uh, which data to access, if the data is replicated, same data is replicated in the environment, then we have different policies for, for picking the data that's closest to, to the execution site or some other preferences that uh, the users provide. We also enable users to plug in uh, their own uh, algorithms into Pegasus for data selection. And but about crashing, so we, we're actually working on a new version of Pegasus 5.0, and that's uh, a lot of major changes for that version. And we do a lot and a lot and a lot of testing. Uh, we do in house testing uh, with a variety of different applications. And then we ask our early, uh, our closest collaborators to test the software in their environment. So that they report a number of bugs uh, to us before it gets released more broadly. And then when we release more broadly, yes, sometimes it does crash and uh, we, we get reports back. But hopefully at that time, it doesn't happen uh, that often anymore. And you had mentioned that that is version 5.0? Yes, so it's going to come out uh, hopefully in the next month or so. Yeah. Oh, that's fast. Okay, still yeah. a lot of productivity going on during quarantine. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had also noted that uh, the role of AI and automation brings opportunities and challenges for Pegasus and scientific workflows in general. So for us non-scientists in the audience, can you translate how AI factors into how your program um, actually creates a workflow system? Yes, so I think AI can be used in a number of ways. Some of it, uh, really at every level of a workflow system. So in some cases, it can suggest to the scientists, for example, some workflows that would be appropriate for a particular data set that the scientist is exploring. So it could be that you know you have a, a workflow gallery and, and the system can, can, AI can help you pick out the type of workflows that would fit your data best. Um, it could on the workflow management system side, what we've been doing is we uh, we're looking at machine learning technologies to look at abnormalities, um, anomalies in, in the execution of a workflow, so that uh, the, the algorithm looks along the execution um, uh, as the workflow is executing and find, then finds things that are different from others or they, they, they could be uh, um, an error or anomaly in the system and try to, to figure out what it is and repair it. 
So there are a number of ways that, that we can incorporate um, AI and uh, to make the system better and the scientists more productive. Fantastic. And is LIGO available? Um, that's how you pronounce it, right? LIGO? LIGO. LIGO. Yeah. Is LIGO available for individuals and companies outside of USC? So, so LIGO is, is a scientific application and a, a separate collaboration that we work with. So these are collaborators and um, they, uh, they made some of the codes and the data available through their own uh, websites. Uh, the Pegasus software is uh, open source and it's available on GitHub for anybody to use outside of uh, USC. And it has a, a pretty broad license um, for usage. Fantastic. Which brings us to our final question, which is the perfect cap to this, I think. How can I get to know more about Pegasus and get involved at a deeper level? Awesome. So um, I'll be happy if uh, you, you send me an email or we also have, uh, you can go to the Pegasus uh, website uh, at pegasus.isi.edu and uh, there are a number of publications. Um, we also have a mailing list and so um, we are happy to answer questions and if people want to try it out or get involved, we're, we're happy to, to point them in the right direction. Fantastic. And I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Dumon. This was incredible. Um, and this was our first non-COVID-19 uh, related <laughs> webinar. So we're so thrilled that you were our pioneer in this new year. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so everyone. much. It's been a, a great pleasure and thank you for attending. Fantastic. Yes, thank you so much to all of our attendees today. Please join us again next week. We have two other exciting programs on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we have Haptics for Communication in a Socially Distanced World featuring Dr. Heather Culbertson and how math can help improve cancer treatment uh, with Dr. Stacey Finley. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you all so much again and fight on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.